Why have we come together? What is it that has us all so concerned? Many have come from halfway around the world to be with us here. It is, I think, the reality of the problem and the glimmer of hope that this enemy of success in a cure of gastrointestinal and gynecologic malignancy may be brought under control. We are learning how to use peritoneectomy and visceral resections to achieve a complete visible clearing of the abdominal and pelvic space. We are learning how to use cancer chemotherapy as an integral part of this surgical intervention. There is now a combined management strategy, perhaps not perfect, but safe enough and effective enough to become a standard of care for selected patients with appendiceal peritoneal metastases, colorectal peritoneal metastases, and peritoneal mesothelioma. The possibilities for prevention and treatment strategies for gastrointestinal and gynecologic malignancy may be nothing short of spectacular. Where did the combined treatment strategies get started? Who made them work? How has it grown so definitively to bring us all together here this evening? I hope this documentary can answer some of these questions. This is Peritoneal Metastases, A Frontier for Progress. People ask why spend so much time and effort dedicated to the study of peritoneal metastases. For Francois Jolly, that answer was easy. This is a terrible problem in oncology that in the past had no reasonable treatments. The French multi-institutional prospective study EVOCAPE-1 was designed to establish the natural history of peritoneal metastases in patients with gastric cancer, colorectal cancer, and pancreas cancer. The data collected was even more shocking than previously expected. It was gathered from the time of diagnosis of the primary cancer with peritoneal seeding in 212 patients and from 158 patients with peritoneal seeding was diagnosed in follow-up. The median survival of 125 gastric cancer patients with peritoneal seeding was 3.1 months. The median survival of 118 colorectal cancer patients with peritoneal seeding was 5.2 months. And for pancreas cancer, it was only 2.1 months. Also, the data showed that extent of disease was an important determinant of survival. Peritoneal metastases should not be recorded, as in the past, as present versus absent, but the disease should be quantitated. Evocape data showed that patients with cancerous nodules less than 5 millimeters lived significantly longer than patients with nodules greater than 5 millimeters. The answer to this question, why study carcinomatosis, is that this is a terrible problem in oncology. Something needed to be done. Perhaps we will never know who first infused cancer chemotherapy into the peritoneal space in a patient with peritoneal metastases. However, it is clear that Dedrick and colleagues at the American National Cancer Institute provided a rationale for direct intraperitoneal administration. Dedrick discovered that the rate at which anti-cancer drugs leave the peritoneal space is considerably slower than the rate at which the body metabolizes or excretes the drug. This results in a marked increased concentration of cancer chemotherapy at the peritoneal surface and also at the surface of a peritoneal cancer nodule as compared to the concentration in the bloodstream and bone marrow. Dedrick and co-workers data showed that intraperitoneal installation would produce greater local efficacy but less systemic toxicity. 
Mitomycin C is a common drug now used for intraperitoneal administration in patients with peritoneal metastases. In this pharmacologic study on the vertical axis, the concentration of the drug is plotted. The time over a period of 90 minutes is shown on the horizontal axis. At all points in time, the intraperitoneal concentration of mitomycin C is much larger than in the blood. Mathematically, the exposure of a cancer nodule is over 200 times greater than the exposure of bone marrow cells. Intraperitoneal administration of selected cancer chemotherapy agents may cause greater efficacy within the peritoneal space and less toxicity to the body. The use of heat to fight cancer is as old as Greek medicine. Hippocrates said, those diseases which medicines do not cure, the knife cures. Those which the knife cannot cure, fire cures. And those which fire cannot cure are to be reckoned wholly incurable. The use of intraperitoneal heat alone to help control cancer was not described until 1940. Shu and Fortner at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center developed an apparatus that looks similar to a modern-day HIPEC machine. There was a water bath, a heat exchanger, a thermometer, and a pump to maintain a closed circuit for warm saline. In one of the experiments, rats were treated four days after intraperitoneal injection of cancer cells. The treatment was for 30 minutes, and the temperature was 43 degrees centigrade. Data shows the percentage of experimental animals surviving the peritoneal metastases over time. The upper line shows the survival of heat-treated rats. The lower line shows the survival of control rats. In these and several other experiments, intraperitoneal heat significantly improved the survival of rats inoculated with intraperitoneal cancer. There can be no doubt that John Spratt was the first to bring these laboratory observations together as a clinical experiment. A delivery system for hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy was created. He called the apparatus the Thermal Infusion Filtration System, or TIFS. The apparatus was originally described as a master's thesis at the University of Missouri. After Dr. Spratt moved to Louisville, Kentucky, he treated a 33-year-old man with pseudomyxoma peritonei. First, he performed surgical resection, and this was followed by intraperitoneal heated thiotepa at 42 degrees for 90 minutes. In the manuscript published in Cancer Research, no adverse events were recorded, and the procedure was repeated with methotrexate eight days later. The long-term outcome of this clinical research is not known. Curiously, the HIPEC technology described by Spratt was not further developed in the United States or Europe. However, the Japanese were quick to see the possible applications to treat or prevent peritoneal metastases from gastric cancer. Koga and co-workers in Yonago, Japan, took Spratt's concept back to the animal laboratory. They treated rats by continuous hyperthermic peritoneal perfusion, introducing a new Japanese drug, mitomycin C. Donru rats inoculated intraperitoneally with an ascites hepatoma survived longer when treated with heat plus mitomycin C, group four, versus heat alone, group three, or mitomycin C alone, group five. Also, Koga and his team reported in 1988 a study to prevent peritoneal metastases in cirrhosal-positive gastric cancer patients treated with mitomycin C. The historical control and randomized studies were both positive. This study was the first effort to use an adjuvant HIPEC. 
it was the forerunner of the current prospective and randomized study Gastri Chip. Fujimoto and colleagues from Kiba, Japan, published a series of articles on treatment of peritoneal metastases and prevention of peritoneal metastases from gastric cancer, which included randomized studies. Fujimura, Yanimura, and others from Kanazawa, Japan, introduced cisplatinum at 300 milligrams and mitomycin C at 30 milligrams as a HIPEX solution to prevent peritoneal metastases. In his 58 randomized patients, heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy was more effective than normothermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, and the control patients survived least. The pharmacologic studies showed high concentration of chemotherapy in the peritoneal space, but limited penetration into the cancer nodule occurred only by simple diffusion. Also, data showed no long-term survival if intraperitoneal chemotherapy was used in patients with visible cancer. Nodules needed to be extremely small, preferably microscopic in size. To treat metastases, the peritoneectomy procedures were developed. A fixed retractor, proper patient position, high voltage electrosurgery along with a generous amount of patience and persistence were necessary to achieve a complete visible resection of peritoneal metastases and involved viscera. An observation not uncommon to cancer treatments was that not all patients benefited. As a larger number of patients were treated, the clinical features and histopathology could be analyzed and the prognostic features of peritoneal metastases patients could be determined. This makes it possible to select patients most likely to benefit. We reported that patients with appendiceal malignancy survived better than colon cancer patients. Complete cytoreduction was far superior to incomplete. Small or moderate volume of peritoneal metastases showed improved survival as compared to gross disease. After the peritoneal cancer index became available, quantitating the extent of disease became necessary in all patients. In the early 1990s, heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy returned from Japan to both Europe and the United States. Francois Jolly and Annie Sayag reported on an experimental study in dogs, but they rapidly moved to the treatment of patients with peritoneal metastases. The goal of their efforts was to standardize an apparatus that would safely and reproducibly treat patients with peritoneal metastases using a heated chemotherapy solution with mitomycin C. In the U.S., several groups focused on safety and efficacy of cytoreductive surgery plus perioperative heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. However, to this point in time, no one had assessed the functional status and quality of life of these patients before and after treatment. In a National Institutes of Health funded protocol, Logie and co-workers studied 64 patients' function and quality of life. They used an assessment tool called Functional Assessment of Cancer Therapy for Colon Malignancy, or FACT. Postoperatively, the FACT score decreased. By three months, it was back to baseline, and by six months, exceeded baseline values. The improvement in functional assessment as compared to baseline was most evident in patients who had malignant ascites. Franz Zoltmulder had been interested in peritoneal metastases throughout his surgical career. 
His Dutch surgical thesis, defended in 1981, was concerned with experimental peritoneal metastases. In the presence of a peritoneal wound, 10 to 100 times fewer cancer cells were needed to establish tumor growth after intraperitoneal injection compared to mice with intact peritoneum. The intact peritoneum protected mice against peritoneal metastases. He also showed that tumor cells embedded in fibrin were protected against irrigation with saline or with cytotoxic solutions. In other words, the fibrin matrix protected the cancer cells. He concluded that surgical trauma played a prominent role in peritoneal metastases with gastrointestinal malignancy. Professor Zoltmulder said, when I heard about heated chemotherapy washing of the abdomen and pelvis after a maximal surgical effort, I felt compelled to try and prove or disprove that peritoneal metastases could be effectively treated. He did a number of things in an orderly manner to try and answer this question. First, he gathered together a great group of people at Anton von Leeuwenhoek Hospital who energetically helped him with this project. Second, he attempted to optimize the intraperitoneal chemotherapy used after a maximal surgical effort so that it was not only effective but also safe. His studies developed a high-dose heated mitomycin C solution given at times 0 minutes, 30 minutes, and 60 minutes for a 90-minute irrigation of the peritoneal space. This intraoperative treatment is still the standard of care in Holland. Third, he gained considerable experience with cytoreductive surgery. Then a randomized trial was initiated. Patients in this trial were documented to have peritoneal metastases from colon or rectal cancer. In the experimental group, patients received a maximal cytoreductive surgery plus HIPEC. The other patients received the standard of care. After 105 patients, there was a statistically significant improvement in the survival with a p-value of 0.032. Because of this definitive survival advantage, the Ethics Committee closed the study. Cytoreductive surgery in HIPEC continues as a standard of care in Holland for patients with peritoneal metastases from colorectal cancer. Moran and co-workers started performing cytoreductive surgery with perioperative chemotherapy for Pseudomyxoma peritonei in 1994 and have reported on over 1,000 cases. As he reviewed the first 100 consecutive patients, it became clear that there was a profound change in the outcome of this complex surgical procedure. It did not appear as though there was a great difference over time with efficacy. However, there were tremendous differences over time in the safety of this procedure. He divided these first 100 patients into three groups. In the first group of 33 patients, the mortality was 18%, 15% underwent reoperation for bleeding, and there was a 12% incidence of anastomotic leakage. In the second group of 33 patients, the mortality dropped drastically to 3%. The operations for bleeding decreased also, as did the anastomotic leakage rate. In the final group of 34 patients, the mortality remained at 3%, but there were no reoperations for bleeding and no anastomotic leakage. Moran concluded that the main components of this learning curve involved patient selection, technical factors, and an improved infrastructure involving teamwork. Our efforts to cure peritoneal metastases would not be where they are today in the absence of multi-institutional studies. In 2004, Glahan and colleagues from 28 institutions 
gathered retrospective data on 506 patients with colon or rectal cancer treated with cytoreductive surgery and perioperative intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Appendiceal malignancy patients were excluded. The absolute requirement for complete cytoreduction was confirmed. The five-year survival for patients having a complete cytoreduction was 31%. In the multivariant analysis, significant variables were completeness of cytoreduction, second look surgery, extent of peritoneal metastases by PCI, lymph node involvement, age, tumor differentiation, and synchronous resection of liver metastases. The next multi-institutional study was from French-speaking institutions. It was a monumental effort first reported at the 110th Congress of French Surgeons and then at the 8th Biennial SOGI meeting in 2008 in Lyon. These data were published as a monograph in French, but then as separate articles in high-impact journals in English. The graph on overall survival of 1,290 patients showed that cure was a reasonable goal in all diseases treated, including pseudomyxoma peritonei, appendix cancer, colorectal cancer, gastric cancer, and malignant peritoneal mesothelioma. These authors produced data showing that not only were the treatment modalities important, but also the institution performing the treatments had a profound effect on outcome. Although HIPEC with mitomycin C or mitomycin C plus cisplatinum was a standard of care in these multi-institutional reports, a new and perhaps more modern HIPEC was reported in 2008. Carefully controlled in this study was the selection of patients. With hyperthermic intraperitoneal oxaliplatinum and systemic 5-fluorouracil, a 51% survival was achieved at five years. The standard treatment group of matched patients was 13%, what might be expected with systemic chemotherapy only. The efforts of SOGI since its beginning have been to promote research and to educate regarding peritoneal metastases treatment and the outcomes that are expected. Our SOGI meeting in Madrid in 2004 had 300 participants and the exchange of information resulted in a special issue of European Journal of Surgical Oncology. In 2006, we had a SOGI meeting in Milan. This was a consensus meeting using the Delphi methodology. The term HIPEC was born, and the many concepts for optimal treatment were standardized. A special issue of Journal of Surgical Oncology was produced. A special issue of the Cancer Journal resulted from the 2008 meeting in Lyon, France. Our collaborative efforts with European Society of Surgical Oncology to implement the European Peritoneal Surface Oncology Training Program is now available with an established curriculum. Most of you are aware that SOGI 2016 in Washington, D.C. is the first SOGI conference in the USA. All prior meetings were in Europe. However, the efforts to share research data and educate regarding the management of peritoneal metastases has been active in the United States. The first international symposium on regional cancer therapies was held in 2006 and has continued through 2016. They produced a special issue of Annals of Surgical Oncology on peritoneal metastases from each of the 11 international symposia held to date. 
The efforts to prevent or treat peritoneal metastases are active in Asia. Yanni Mura directs a peritoneal metastases consortium in the Osaka area. There are four hospitals engaged in the treatment of peritoneal metastases, especially those of appendiceal and colorectal origins. Efforts throughout Japan continue with special emphasis on the management of peritoneal metastases from gastric cancer. There are multiple centers for research and clinical practice in Korea. In China, many institutions are involved in peritoneal surface oncology clinical and laboratory research. The outstanding efforts of Dr. Li in Beijing deserve special mention. There is a Japanese School of Peritoneal Surface Oncology, which has its own textbook and established curriculum. David Morris and his team have maintained a high level of productivity. Here at SOGI 2016, there is a lot of time and thought directed towards the management of ovarian cancer. Perhaps complete cytoreductive surgery with peritoneal and visceral resections the way SOGI recommends, along with HIPEC, can bring about a significant survival benefit with this disease. We also talked a lot about prevention. Will this be the greatest contribution of perioperative chemotherapy to the management of gastrointestinal cancer? Is there a new and more effective HIPEC to add to cytoreduction to preserve the surgical complete response? Maybe long-term intravenous and intraperitoneal chemotherapy will be the focus of our next clinical trials adventures. We have come a long way. We have a long way to go. It is a global effort.